Hello and welcome to Kirsty's virtual classroom. Um, today we're going to be working on groundwater, which is our most precious commodity right now. Um, we've talked about surface water previously, and um, this has to do with when the surface water finally percolates into the ground, it becomes what we know as the groundwater. And the groundwater is where we get most of our potable water, and that is water that is drinkable. Um, so it's clean enough for us to drink and use for things like irrigation, um, and we'll talk a lot more about water as we go through this. Okay, so porosity and permeability are some terms that I introduced with surface water. And just to reiterate, porosity is the pore spaces, so that's how much open space there is for water to actually flow through, whether that's rock or soil, sediment, gravel, sand, silt, clay, etc. Um, and that can be just the spaces between the grains, that can be the fractures in the rock. It all just depends on what type of material is below whatever area you're looking at. And then the permeability is the measure of the water's ability, or the material's ability, excuse me, to actually transmit the water down into the groundwater. And so something with a high porosity is also going to have a high permeability because the water can actually flow through um, the material really well. So you want something with a high porosity and a high permeability um, because that means that your groundwater will be recharged really easily. So with surface water, um, it interacts with groundwater in a couple of different ways. So in a stream situation, um, there's two ways that this can happen. We can have a gaining stream or we can see a losing stream. And it depends on how high the groundwater is. So if the groundwater is particularly high in an area, like you see here, um, the water table or the groundwater will actually interact with the stream and add to the stream's flow. Um, so the stream flow might not just be exclusive to precipitation or snow melt, um, it might also be gaining some of its water from the water table. In the opposite scenario, where the water table is relatively low compared to the stream channel, you're going to see loss of stream or surface water to the groundwater. Um, and that's because as the water sits on the surface and flows downstream, it also percolates into the material and then eventually ends up in the groundwater. Um, so if the water table is high and is adding to the stream, we call it a gaining stream. If the groundwater is low and it is losing water from the stream, we call it a losing stream. Other things that happen in groundwater are things like karst topography. Um, this includes the dissolution of material, usually limestone, due to the water interacting with the material. Um, and usually this happens in things like, in forms things like caves, sinkholes, and sinking streams. We see a lot of this in Florida because they have a lot of limestone. Um, and when surface water percolates down into the groundwater, it ends up aiding in that decay or the erosion of the limestone, creating the caves, sinkholes, and sinking streams. To give you an idea of how a sinkhole would form, usually this starts with a cave that has been um, dug over hundreds of years by the groundwater as it eroded the material. Um, and then surface water can sit at the top and try to percolate down into the cave. Um, and a lot of the time what happens is this um, cave is a void space, right? So the material that sits on top of that void space has no support. And without support and you add an added water to the area, that's going to allow for this little section here that has water to become even weaker um, and eventually cave in. So this happens a lot. <laughs> um, and it's not always a very small area. Sometimes it's as big as um, this one that happened in a Corvette museum. So <clears throat> these are all real size cars um, that fell into a sinkhole in this private museum. And uh, he hopefully had very good insurance. <laughs> and then other ones can be very large, like this one in Guatemala. This is from poor infrastructure. And by poor infrastructure, I mean leaking pipes. So when pipes leak, they add additional water to the soil that isn't there naturally or from infiltration. Um, and there's usually a lot of water moving through water pipes. And in that case, it's going to erode the material much more readily. And if that happens, you're going to see large areas that will create either caves or sinkholes 
This one happens to be a very exaggerated version of that. Other ways that groundwater can interact with surface water is through something called a spring. And so um, a natural spring occurs when you have high groundwater and a lot of steep topography. So with a lot of steep topography, um, you're going to see this in mountain ranges or mountain areas. Um, the Sierra Nevada near Fresno is a very good example of this. Um, this is so you have high groundwater here, and when it interacts with the hill, water comes basically shooting out the side of the hill. Um, this also happens in bedrock where you have cracks in the rock, and where those cracks are is usually where the water sits. And so you'll see water just kind of seep out of some of the bedrock. Um, so here's some pictures of natural springs. This would be a soil situation like this one here on the left, and this one down here would be more of a bedrock situation. Um, so you'll see something like this bedrock situation if you ever drive up um, Highway 168 to Shaver area. Um, you'll see a lot in the spring and early summertime, the springs that come out of um, the granite that's, that's up there that's been carved out from that four lane. Um, so you can see this pretty nearby if you wanted to go take a look. Um, other groundwater surface water interactions include oasises. So in a situation where the bedrock or the rock underneath the particular area is folded. So if you remember from a couple units ago, we talked about folds and this would be an anticline here, concave down. And if groundwater sits at the top of one of these layers and that layer is perched to the surface, then you'll end up seeing some perched groundwater as the form of an oasis. And the oasis is usually like a little pond in the middle of a desert or middle of a valley. And it's often short lived, especially if it's in a desert area like this, um, because it's so hot. It's not very normal to have a lot of surface water sitting on the surface. So it will um, evaporate and um, not be there after a while. But um, some of them will last a little bit longer than others. It depends on how much water is present. Other groundwater interactions we see is between the freshwater and the saltwater. Um, the saltwater includes everything basically along the coastlines because all ocean water is salty. And so um, near coastlines, we have a freshwater saltwater interface. So you can see that here. There's the freshwater here on the left and saltwater or the ocean here off of the coast. And usually there's this nice little interface layer that is basically the exchange between the freshwater and the saltwater. Um, but if you over pump your freshwater, so if you install a well into your freshwater and over pump it, what it's going to do is it's going to pull the saltwater into your well and you'll lose your well to what we call saltwater intrusion. You really don't want this to happen because you can't ever get it back. Um, once you've intruded your well with saltwater, um, you're going to have a really, really hard time getting fresh, clean water that you can actually drink from that well. Um, so you'd be better off redrilling a well further inland, or in some cases, when they know that this may be an issue, they will install barriers um, that are impermeable that will not allow salt water to flow through. And so even if under heavy pumping circumstances, they're less likely to have salt water intrusion into those wells. So when we talk about groundwater, we want to talk about a few different zones. So the first zone that water will enter once it starts percolating into the ground is the zone of aeration. So this zone is also known as the unsaturated zone. And the unsaturated zone is an area where all of the pore spaces are filled with both water and air. Um, most of it is air until you get down into the zone of saturation. Okay. Um, once you get down into the zone of saturation, every pore space is filled with water, okay? And the water table marks the top of that zone of saturation. So then above the water table, we have something called the capillary fringe, which is a narrow zone that's just above the water table where there is um, negative pressure. And so what's happening is because the zone of saturation is full of high pressure, because all the pore spaces are filled with something, either it's either sediment or it's um, water, 
And up here in the zone of aeration, there's a lot of airspace. This is a lower pressure. The zone of saturation is a higher pressure. And most material on Earth would like to go from an area of high pressure to low pressure. Um, so the capillary fringe is just a narrow zone where water is migrating upwards. Um, but eventually gravity wins the battle there and um, pulls everything down into the zone of saturation. Okay, so <clears throat> when we want to talk about the groundwater, we also want to talk about where we get the groundwater. And so the groundwater is held in something called an aquifer, which is any rock or sediment that's permeable enough for us to actually use um, the water from it. So whether that use is for um, agriculture or drinking or what have you, um, they're all stored in something called an aquifer. And aquifers are divided into subgroups. Confined aquifers, unconfined aquifers, aquitards, and aquacludes. So a confined aquifer is something that is surrounded by confining layers. And so those confining layers are generally impermeable, which means that material or water, excuse me, cannot actually flow through it very well anyway. Um, and in that case, you get a confined aquifer, and so there's not a lot of good recharge into that aquifer. Now, an unconfined aquifer hosts the top of the water table. And so, particularly in Fresno, we have an unconfined aquifer and a confined aquifer. Um, and luckily for us, we do have some serious contamination in the northwest Fresno area of something called trichloroethylene. And um, that stuff is pretty bad and needs to be treated pretty significantly before it can be distributed to homes or even out to ag fields. Um, and if we didn't have a confined aquifer, the confined aquifer, which sits around 300 feet below our ground surface here in Fresno, um, it would also be contaminated with, excuse me, it would also be contaminated with that trichloroethylene. Um, so luckily the confining unit, although it doesn't allow for rapid recharge of the confined aquifer, it does help protect it from contaminants. Um, and then we also have aquatards and aquacludes. An aquatard will slow down the flow between the aquifers, and an aquaclude will completely exclude the flow. So it really depends on the situation. Things that would be aquatards and aquacludes would be clay material, um, because clay does not allow water to transmit through it very well. And so when we look at that, um, an aquatard would be here, an aquaclude here. This isn't necessarily the case um, in every area. Um, and not every location has a confined aquifer. It really just depends on the soil types. Um, but like I said, an aquatard will slow the flow between the aquifers, so there is some exchange here. But if this was an aquatard, like you see here, then um, there would be no actual flow between the aquifers. It excludes the flow, if you will. So then another thing that we're going to look at is artesian wells. So if the well that you're installing or that somebody installs is placed below the pressure surface for whatever um, groundwater aquifer they are tapping into, then you're going to see um, pressure being applied through that well and out of the well. Um, so here we have a scenario where the beds are folded and so the saturation level or the water table is here at this elevation but the well has been placed down in this valley. And so if you do that, um, what's gonna end up happening is the pressure from this surface is going to be applied throughout this aquifer and is gonna push water out of this well. Um, and so you'll see something like this where water is just kind of flowing outward um, from a well. And this is because these wells were placed below the pressure surface for whatever aquifer they were developed in. So you would want to either build this well up to the correct pressure service or you would adjust it so that you would put it in a different location, just kind of dependent on your needs. So not everywhere has the same type of aquifer. Um, our aquifer here in the Central Valley looks a bit like sand and gravel and most of it's unconsolidated which is kind of a good thing um, because if our material was really compacted or really cemented together into basically like a sandstone or conglomerate, it would not hold as much water as it does for us with it being unconsolidated. Um, so it's pretty good that um, we have that scenario because we don't have a lot of surface water present. Um, and then other areas up in Oregon and Washington, we see a lot of volcanic rock. 
Um, so volcanic rock is not as porous as unconsolidated sand and gravel. Um, so they rely a little bit more on surface water in those areas. Um, and then we have some semi-consolidated sand down in the south and east. And um, they're going to rely on the minimal pore spaces between those sand grains. Um, and then we have glacial till up in the northeast. Um, so that's going to be all the material left behind by a glacier, which is kind of a mixture of different materials and sizes. Another interaction we have is between magma and water. Um, when magma is intruding, particularly in an area where there's a known volcano, so like Yellowstone, um, and we have groundwater present, groundwater is going to heat up and percolate or find little holes in um, the crust and actually form something called a geyser, which is when water actually boils. When it gets hot, it's going to produce steam, right? So you've seen that with a pot on a stove or like a tea kettle. Um, eventually a tea kettle gets so hot that the whistle blows and steam starts flowing out of it. Um, that's because it's been heated by the um, burner, right? So the burner in this case would be the magma. And so when the magma heats up the water, you see geysers form like Old Faithful. So this is Old Faithful in Yellowstone. <clears throat> this is basically just steam from the groundwater that's being heated from the magma. So how do you get your groundwater? How do you get water into your house anyway? Um, so a lot of people don't realize, but that pressure surface that I was talking about that helps get water from the groundwater to that artesian well is also how you get water into your house. Um, it really does help lessen the electricity and um, pumping ne necessities or needs. Um, and we, we use a little bit less energy by using a large water tank. So you'll see in a lot of neighborhoods, they're usually covered by a lot of trees and they try to hide them so you can't just see this glaringly obvious water tank. Um, but that water tank is used to bring the pressure surface up higher so that it'll naturally flow through the pipes and into your homes. Um, they use this at Fresno State. You've seen their very large water tower with the bulldog on it. Um, that's there to help the pressure surface be um, really high because they have buildings that are taller than a normal house um, or an average size home. And so they need the tower to be a little bit taller than um, your neighborhood tower. So in the San Joaquin Valley and in the Sacramento Valley, um, we see a lot of agriculture which contributes to a very large portion of the usage of our groundwater. Um, and then in Sacramento, they have a lot of industry as well. Um, so we do have surface water groundwater interactions here um, in the San Joaquin Valley and the Sacramento Valley. Um, and in the San Joaquin Valley especially, we've seen a lot of something called subsidence. Um, and subsidence is um, a big deal because once land subsides, you really can't get that land back. So some of the things that contribute to subsidence is heavy pumping. So in um, an area where you have several wells developed, especially if they are ag wells, you're going to see very heavy pumping. Um, or if you're in a city where um, there is a very large population, you'll see a lot of over pumping as well. And so if we have a lot of over pumping, you have a lowered groundwater and it creates something called a cone of depression. Um, and the cone of depression is just the area where the water is depressed. It is significantly lowered in a particular area. In Fresno right now, that area is around southeast, or sorry, southwest Fresno, which is some of the old, like downtown, the older parts of Fresno, um, because we've been pumping down there for over 100 years now. So with groundwater subsidence, um, here are some examples for you. One of the largest that we've seen, um, really in the, in the U.S. anyway, um, is Southwest Mendota, which it's pretty close to home. They've lost about 29 feet since World War II, which is pretty significant amount of elevation. So they've um, literally, it's not groundwater elevation that is being represented there. That is actually land surface elevation that they have lost. So here's an illustration for, for you. This is a um, utility pole, and this was taken in 1977. We have some up-to-date ones. Um, I think that were done last year or the year before, but they haven't publicly released those yet, I don't believe. Um, 
But um, this is Joe Poland, who is a USGS uh, scientist who was doing some work on the subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley. And um, he represented the 29 feet here um, that has subsided since 1925. Um, so this isn't actually the pole, wasn't actually the ground wasn't actually you know here on this pole necessarily. Um, the ground elevation was here prior to 1925, and at in 1977 this is where the ground elevation sits. Um, so it's pretty significant subsidence, and the reason for the subsidence is from all of the pumping. If the water is never returned or recharged into the groundwater, that material settles slowly and slowly and slowly. And so when you settle the material and never actually recharge the groundwater, it actually compresses all of it and you lose elevation at the surface. So there was heavy pumping in Mendota for agricultural purposes, and that led to significant subsidence in the area. So a lot of people ask about, well, if we don't have enough groundwater, can we desalinate or can we use ocean water to figure out how to drink it? And that is in significant works right now in areas like Carlsbad. They now have a plant, which you can tour if you would like. Um, but uh, they have an area where they have set up um, both of these distillation and reverse osmosis systems and then um, going through kind of a layered um, sediment to further clean everything out and get it closer to a groundwater scenario. Um, and then they are adding that water to the distribution system for the San Diego area and actually sending it to distribution, which is pretty cool. Um, so the way that this works, um, for instance, in the distillation scenario, um, is water comes into this condensing coil where um, it basically heats up all of the water that is coming in and the salt will actually drop out and the condensing coil will condense all of the water molecules, so all the H2O molecules together, and it will drop out on this other side of the tank and then be pumped out. And then everything that is salt um, consists of a lot of salt still, you're going to see it flow out the other end. Um, in another scenario, you would have water flowing into this rever reverse osmosis situation, and um, they push down on the water. You have this permeable, I'm sorry, um, only NaCl or sodium chloride permeable um, barrier here, which is usually known as a membrane. And this membrane is only permeable to the salt water molecules and the H2O, or sorry, to the H2O molecules and the salt water molecules, it's impermeable to. So the salt water molecules will flow out the drain and the H2O molecules can flow through this membrane and back out the other side to then be further um, cleaned and then distributed. Um, another way to treat groundwater, not necessarily surface water, is through something called air sparging. So if an area is highly contaminated um, and pump and treat is not necessarily available, they will apply <clears throat> air into the groundwater, kind of aerate everything, and then all of those aerate bubbles are usually where we see contaminants, so like gasoline, um, diesel, some of these other um, chemicals that we've seen in like dry cleaners, they will kind of latch on to the air bubbles and then those can be extracted and then treated um, as vapors. And then this usually does a fairly good job of cleaning up the groundwater. Um, depending on the level of the contaminant, it might need pump and treat though. So in the area where it is a very significant contaminant flume and it needs pump and treat. You'll see um, extraction wells put in. Um, this is something that I used to do a lot. So they'll put in extraction wells and the wells will suck in the groundwater. It will be taken into a holding tank and then treatment and then it will be discharged into a stream or a canal or something like that. Um, and this is usually what the vessels look like. These are granulated activated carbon vessels, or we call them GAC vessels when I worked for industry, um, and the 
theory there is that something like a chlorinated solvent, like the trichloroethylene that I talked about before, or tetrachloroethylene, PCE maybe you've heard of, um, those are commonly used in dry cleaners. And um, carbon loves them. So when water flows through the carbon, the carbon latches on to all of those molecules and lets the, the cleaner H2O flow through. Um, and then that is discharged either to a stream um, or a canal, usually in uh, urban areas. Okay. And that's the end of the groundwater unit. Um, I will link this video that's here for you on um, campus. Um, it is another YouTube video just to kind of get you thinking about what groundwater is. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.